So the long and short of it is that night I meditated and I had the most intense experience in my breathwork session. It's like the ancestors knew they were going to be called on and I'm telling you they were already rearranging the timeline. I didn't sleep that night. I was like, oh, I was dizzy. I was like, oh, this is intense, but I'm, I'm here for the ride. I'm here for the ride. So what appears to have power has none. What appears to have no power has all of the power. Welcome, dear listeners, to another episode of the Oliver Shear Show. Let me be your dream catcher. Let me help you to get those dreams closer to you by going out and finding guests that share with us mind-altering and expanding topics, knowledge, and insights so that you can move forward and get closer to grab that dream that brings you closer with your true self, your soul, and your bigger you, and to the universe and all there is. And welcome to today's episode, where I'm talking with Monica Painter. Monica is a former stay-at-home mom and a registered nurse that transformed into being a certified quantum healer. And in our discussion, we got a lot of storytellings, a lot of sharing from her own life, how self-love and putting boundaries, compassion and unconditional love helped her to heal her family and her close relatives. And there are many stories here, how adversities helped her to move forward and be able to actually help other people, changing their life as a spiritual guide and spiritual coach for others. So we get to talk about self-love, compassion, unconditional love, understanding the signals of life and how gratitude can help you to grow and move forward. We also talk about meditation, breathwork, the combination of both and how the sound of your own voice helps you during meditations. Uh, we also get to talk about water purification and what water means for her in her life and in her business how she was creating an online presence and business so she can help others enjoy today's talk and welcome to Monica. Hello, hello. This is another Oliver Schirach show and today I have a new guest, Monica Painter. And Monica Painter is a retired, uh, how do you call it, um, registered nurse. Yeah, RN, you yeah. wrote here. Certified quantum healer, conscious wealth mentor, reality bender, and a rebel mom, and someone with a really cool backdrop there with a really cool banner in the background. I love it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you 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 sent me like a little introduction that you're a retired mom uh, of three, and you came uh, on this online space around three years ago after leaving nursing. Uh, because you refused to get um, vaccinated against your will. And uh, now you're a healer and conscious coach, and you're inspiring a lot of people to take radical responsibility for creating a new amazing life for themselves. Yeah, that was kind of your introduction. Yeah. I was introduced. That's me. <laughs> That's you. I was introduced to you and a few other people from Isha Patel, which I interviewed this. Um, what was it, July? So mm, you were amazing. apparently you were apparently trained by her. So, yes. So let's find out. Uh, I normally ask some icebreaker questions, which give me openings to ask further questions. So, how would you describe yourself in three words? Oh wow! Well, describe myself in three words. Okay. Um, I would say the first word would be love, peace, and acceptance. And why? What is the reasons for these three words? Why love? Love is the first word because I believe that that is our only truth that we can really acknowledge as a collective we all have our own individual truths but the one truth i believe is love unconditional love i believe that we came here to support the earth and one another ourselves first and to overflow you know to open our hearts and to really see the value in everyone and everything 
And we do that through our heart, through love. It's the ultimate way to create for the highest good of all. Yeah. And when you say love is, um, what did you say? Love is the truth. Um, how do you look at it? Uh, how do you love? Do you start loving the other or do you start loving yourself? Or is there no difference? Well, I believe from my personal experience that what I have been shown is, or what I have experienced, is that you can only love another to the extent with which you love yourself. And so I feel that everything outside of us is a projection of what is within, that we are the only one in the room, that this is all our own beautiful, magical dream that we are creating. Well, it gets to be beautiful and magical. It could also be traumatic and painful if that's what we have chosen. But I remember when I first really found the seed that said to me, you are the creator of your own reality, that there's nothing outside of you creating what you're experiencing in this world. And that was empowering and terrifying all at the same time. And as I started to do the inner work, you know, whether it's through meditation or uh, speaking to yourself in the mirror, you know, telling yourself that you love yourself is something that simple. I realized that the more that I was willing to love and accept every single part of me, that the external world was shifting right before my eyes. And so as mothers, we're taught to really martyr ourselves and fathers as parents, you know, just as human beings, <laughs> we are taught through many different things, religion being one of them, you know, that we should martyr ourselves and that we give and give and give, but we forget this concept of the overflowing cup which is where all of the great masters gave from. They didn't give from an empty cup. They weren't martyring themselves. Jesus, Buddha, their, their, their needs were met and they were able to give from an overflowing cup. And so as I started to really feel a difference in the way that I was mothering because I began to love myself and give myself the care that I needed, I was experiencing new levels of love and peace and joy with my children in choosing myself. And so that I feel that that love must first be cultivated within. We've got to take the time and the effort for ourselves. And then that gets to be overflowed to, is that a word? Overflowed <laughs> it, to yeah. the world. Yes to our children and then our children's experiences get to shift. And then, you know, you learn to love for me, you, you love the spouse that you used to have, that you all created a mess together and, but you still find the beauty in them because you found the beauty in yourself. You got to find the beauty in yourself first. And then that love can overflow and then everything shifts there too. And you get to have a peaceful life. So. I believe that the short answer is I absolutely believe that that love must first start within and then it can overflow to the world around you. Yeah. I, I don't know how many times I got that feeling uh, coming back to the sentence from, from the Bible or from the church, right? Love the others um, or love the others you love yourself or something like that. Um, yeah. But for me, it's always the opposite way around, right? First, you need to start to love yourself. And, and I have the feeling when I listen to the church, perhaps it's just from the German way. It's like, you have to love the others. You have to help the others. Even if, if, if you have no love for yourself, even if you hate yourself. And I also had a, a friend through my ex-wife uh, in the beginning of my depression. He said, like, you should go to church and you should do some voluntary work and you will feel better. And I, I had this intuition saying, you know, some people are the givers for that, right? They will flourish. They will feel good because now they're doing what they're meant to do. Other people are not meant to do that. 
So just to have that as a simple answer, you know, go and share love with others, it doesn't make sense. Uh, but as you say, it's like, love yourself first, then, because if you love yourself, you cannot be angry, right? And then, then you're much nicer yeah. to the people around you and they cannot really be angry with you. And, and, and there's so many, uh, not that many, but a few moments I can remember. Perhaps there's more that I cannot remember where I was just so at peace with myself and no, neither my mom, my dad, my sister, some annoying friends, no one really pissed me off. They just tried to annoy me or things that normally annoy me. And uh, it just was flowing down my back or, you know, rolling down the back. And I was just happy. I, I think that's what it is. So for you, when you say you see the, the life changing in front of your eyes, do you have any examples? I mean, how have you been before you started the self love? Um, you know, so I can give you I can give you a specific example. <clears throat> so, and it it transformed all very quickly. So, not maybe a little over a year ago, I had decided with the with you know through a conversation and engaging with one of my children that we were going to homeschool her. She went to middle school and every day she came home and she cried. She didn't like the experience. She is an empath. She definitely tends to take on the emotions of those around her. She's just a little wide open star seed. She sees the world and, you know, she doesn't understand why do we have uh, group punishment? Like, I didn't do anything wrong. Why would they punish me? I didn't do anything wrong. And this was what grade was it? Sixth grade. This was sixth grade for her. And she just could not come to terms with the way that, that school was operating. And so she went to school one day, came home crying. We talked about it. She went to school the next day, came home crying. And she was like, mom, I, I don't want to get, I don't want to get on the bus tomorrow. And I, I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't going to have her go. I was like, okay. But then I was like, oh, I'm like back against the wall. I've got to have this conversation with my co-parent who is fully entrenched in the medical care system, you know, in the education system. And so in the past, I would have had so much fear as opposed to love because it's a choice. We're always choosing fear or love, fear or love. And I don't know that if I had needed to have that conversation, perhaps I would have had it, but it might've gone quite differently. Mm -hmm. But what happened is I had that conversation with him and there was a big blow up. There was a big blow up, a blow up that I won't even describe because it's outrageous, but it was big and it was not pretty. And I could have leaned into that experience, his reaction and made it a lot bigger. Right? I could have fueled the fire, but I chose not to. I chose to really sit back with it and just be honestly be as quiet as I could while still setting boundaries and advocating for myself. But the advocation was really withdrawing from the interaction with him. And I chose to just surround him with light. I did not badmouth him to his children. I leaned in with his kids and we said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to call on that higher power and we're going to send so much love to your dad surround him with so much light because we have cultivated that within ourselves and we're going to watch it shift and it did and now here we are not quite a year later and he has come to full acceptance of the fact that now one two of the kids are homeschooled now two of the three are homeschooled and he even said to me, I, I'm not, I don't want to fight with you about this. You know how I feel about it. But I, I want to honor their experience. He didn't use those words necessarily, but that's essentially what he was coming from is I'm going to support them because I love them. And so we see this love reflected back because it's all a reflection that is within me. And I experienced so much peace in my co-parenting relationship because of the love that I give myself. And when you love yourself, it, 
I mean, it, it's just natural to love those around you. And so from a quantum perspective, I'd like to explain that a little bit. What happens, you know, you have this field around your body, right? And our field is strengthened and amplified through the heart. And so when we are feeling our heartbeat, it can be that simple. Stop and feel your heartbeat and take a breath into your heart and drop your shoulders and feel the shift in your energy. It's that powerful. And the more we do that, the more powerful, the, the larger this field around us, our heart field becomes. And it is a field of protection. It's a field of protection and it's a field of magnetism. And we magnetize that which we are. We reflect, we magnetize really two different ways of saying that everything outside of us is truly what is within. And as that field grows, we are drawing to us the experiences that support that field because that's how the universe works. When we're in fear and we're constricted, that field draws in and you can feel the constriction of that field. And then we become vulnerable. We become vulnerable and we start experiencing the world as outside of us and relationships of outside of, as outside of us and we give away our power. And so now I just, mm, I revel in the experience that we have created, that I have created because we're all, we are the creator that I have created with my family and the dynamic, you know, people talk about teenagers are a pain in the butt, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And yes, teenagers have a mind of their own and they can be very self-centered because that's where they are in their, uh, you know, growth, um, their neurological growth and such. Um, but I don't have that experience with my kids. My 16 year old is a queen and we have created the most dynamic, exciting experience between one another. And if one of us falls out of the al of alignment, the other one pulls the other back in. So, and it's all based in love. It's all based in love. How can I see the love in this experience? Kuan Yin it describes it as the beauty way. How can I see the beauty in everything? And the only way that we can see the beauty in death and destruction and pain is if we've cultivated love within ourselves. Uh, very nice. Uh, there, there were so many points I would love to go in, and I took some notes, but not of all. Uh, one was you, you, you said the whole thing sh started with you uh, asking your kids, right, to, to shine the light to their father. How did you yeah. do that? Did you sit in a circle? Did you meditate? Um, it wasn't, you know, I, I feel like for kids, especially since, the, I mean, this was last year, so they've grown a bit since then. Um, I feel like for kids, I tend to keep it really simple unless they're in a space where they're like, mom, let's meditate. So we really just sat down in a circle on the floor in Nadia's room. She's the one that was having the experience. And we just talked about it. We talked about it. Uh, you know, what, what is your experience? How are you feeling about this? How can I support you in this? So we supported Nadia and it was a team effort. You know, everyone got to be heard. Everyone got to support her. And then anything else that was coming up for the other kids through the experience, then we all got to support each other with that because they had their big feelings around it too. You know, my 16 year old tends to carry a little more anger and resentment around that experience. And so we worked through that. Nadia was very emotional about it. She was, uh, she was very hurt by it and she was tearful about it. James, uh, he's the young, my youngest, um, he is a Pisces <laughs> and he was, uh, he was hurt and confused. And so we sat and worked through all of the emotion and then, you know, well, I prefaced it with, we're going to send dad light, but let, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. And so then we actually did just close our eyes and send him light and actually see the light of God, source, spirit, however feels good for someone to refer to that higher power, the prime creator. We just 
we sent we sent light to him. We saw him surrounded in light, and we set the intention that his heart would soften. And it did. But but you didn't tell him anything about that, or I didn't tell him about that having that experience with the kids. I didn't say anything. I don't. I did not feel like he would be in a place of receptivity to for me to say something like that. He was angry. You know, he was angry, which is a mask to sadness. You know, he was sad. Um, and so really my my conversation, my limited conversation with him was really around mm, safety, providing safety for the children, because it was like I said, it was a big situation and uh, setting boundaries and saying, you know, recognize that if something like this happens again, there will be consequences. I will not stay silent. And so I was just setting boundaries with him in a loving, in a firm yet uh, neutral way. I was not charged with emotion when I spoke to him. Now, I, at some point I was charged with emotion and I wasn't ignoring that, but I knew that in order for me to have a productive conversation with him, a short, productive conversation with him that I needed to be in a neutral space and deal with my own emotions so that I could, you know, bring the highest love to him and the kids. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I just also ask so the, the listeners can hear, you do not need to tell the person you send love, you send forgiveness, you send whatever you send to them to actually affect their life in a, in a positive way. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. It sounds like he, he, he was able to release, you say sadness, I don't know him, but perhaps it was sadness because he has this, as you said, school system, um, pharmaceutical system, then probably also the political system, whatever, whatever, right? So he's like caught into the system. I, I know many, yeah. many friends like that, and it's very difficult to talk to them. I'm like, they give me all these hints where things do not work and still they're there. So there's like this, you're hold on and then you get angry and yeah. you get angry and you say you you make me angry like no i just ask you something why why do i make you angry but um that's beautiful so <laughs> what, what what was the other question i had i have <laughs> your 16 year old daughter uh you said is pulling your back or you pull her so how was mm -hmm. the change for your kids um in the introduction say three years ago you made the move, but is it only three years ago you went into the spirituality or um, um, is it three years ago you, you left work? So <clears throat> that was a really fun transition. Um, so I really leaned into spirituality, doing things. I mean, I've always been a very spiritual being. I've always been, you know, all my life, I've always been the person, the little, I mean, I'm 5'1". And some people don't let me claim that one inch, but I'm 5'1", damn it. Um, but, but I've always been, you know, the small but mighty, seeing the light in everyone. And growing up, like I was always the one, I would stand up for people. I would always stand up for people, no matter what. I was very, very fearless, maybe a little... I don't want to say stupid, but sometimes I would stand up to people. It probably wasn't the best idea. I guess I knew I had an angel standing behind me. So, and I always like saw the love and saw the best in people, always felt very connected to nature. A religion always confused me. It never felt, and I was, I was raised uh, from fifth grade on. I wasn't even introduced to religion until fifth grade. That was interesting. And then I was full on Catholic, baptized, got my first communion all in the same week. <laughs> and then went to a Catholic school from fifth grade to graduation. That was interesting. Um, it always felt like something was off, but I didn't know what it was. Uh, it felt very powerless. And so as I grew into an adult, I, I went away from the church and then I came back to the church and I just kind of meandered around, you know, trying to like figure out like, what is my truth in this world? What is my purpose? And so uh, I got into, I became a massage therapist and an esthetician. So I did skincare and massage. And so that was my, that was my real opening to the energetic work. That was when I was 21. And 
I started doing different healing touch techniques. And this is where the opening of energy came to me. And I started to see, uh, I started to have uh, visions every once in a while. And I would also see the movement and feel the movement of energy. So I did that for a little while, but then I, I needed more money to take care of my family. I got married and then we started having children and I was a stay-at-home mom. I never felt like I contributed enough because that's how stay-at-home moms are made to feel. And I thought, okay, what else can I do that I feel deeply called to where I can change the world? And this is when I became a nurse. So I didn't come, become a nurse until I was 30. And I was pregnant with my second child when I found it, I got accepted in nursing school. And then I was pregnant with my third child when I graduated. So I went into nursing. The first half of my career, I was a nurse for about 10 years. The first half of my career, I was a critical care nurse on a bone marrow transplant unit. So very, very sick individuals, um, systemic cancers. It was very sad. I went to the morgue a lot. It was heartbreaking. I drank a lot of wine as a critical care bone marrow transplant nurse. And I decided I needed to leave that space because it was slowly killing me. So I left. I became a physical rehabilitation nurse and started working with spinal cord injuries brain injuries, uh, amputations, all of that. And this is when COVID hit. And so I the spirituality piece came in when uh, not long after I left my first nursing job, uh, my husband and I created a mess in our marriage together. It was just a hot mess. And there was lots of drinking involved. And I don't want to place any blame, but I wanted to evolve and not everyone was on board. And this is when I started, uh, someone planted a seed with, um, wasn't Joe Dispenza. So Joe Dispenza, Abraham Hicks, Wayne Dyer. <laughs> Wayne Dyer was my introduction to sp the spiritual world. I should have shaved more. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. This is perfect. <laughs> So well, I was introduced to Wayne Dyer. I was, I was a nurse still. And this is uh, about six years ago. About six years ago. I was introduced to Wayne Dyer. And then he led me to Abraham Hicks. And I was like, what? I create my own reality? And then I was like, oh, shit. I created this. But then I was like, oh, but I can create something different. And so... uh my let's see Sophia was about 10 and I just start I didn't I just started kind of dripping on her I would in the she was um she was homeschooling at this point and so I would just listen to stuff but I wouldn't put headphones on I just listened to it in the open and so she was she was taking it in she was at home with me throughout the day and she was taking it in and uh we and she's a very she's a very bright little girl and she would start asking questions. And so I would answer the questions and we would start, I would just start sharing with her because she was just very intellectually advanced. So not that you have to be intellectually advanced to get it, but I can have some deep quantum physics conversation with her and she would like get it. It was pretty magical. And so I would start sharing with her and then all the other kids were getting dripped on too. You know, even James, even though he was, you know, uh, let's see, three at the time. Um, and so this was, me empowering and loving myself, empowering my children as well. And so as we amplified the field together, we all became strong enough together to say it's time to make a change. And so that's when their dad and I split and I was strong enough to maintain that boundary. And we went through with the divorce. It was, it got, it was a little messy at first because we were both kind of freaked out trying to figure out how to navigate. But we stayed out of court. We came to agreements where we didn't even have to sit in the room with each other to agree. And we, we signed the papers and then everyone fell apart a little bit, you know, as we were integrating that. Um, we went our separate ways. 
fell apart, built ourselves back up again. And this is when, um, fast forward a little bit, uh, to about two years into being divorced, this one COVID hit. Okay. So, so COVID was not a reason for the divorce uh, for so no. uh, many other people. Nope. nope. We were already divorced. We we're already divorced. And it was really interesting to navigate because him and his family were fully entrenched in the medical care system. Everyone yep. got the jab. And but yep. he did not, he did not push it. I, he, I've always been a natural kind of person, always had questions about vaccinations. And I've been vocal, always been vocal with him about that. And he kind of rolled his eyes at me, our whole marriage around that. <laughs> but he, I made it very clear in a loving way that don't ask, don't even ask because it's not happening. And he honored that and he's honored it ever since. Uh, we were disrupted because I got my dog back home and now I try to find back to where I stopped because we talked a little bit cautiously until my friend left. Uh, I talked about, yeah, my spiritual awakening without the real awakening, as many people talk like the Kundalini awakening or the change of reality around you in an extreme way. I haven't had that. I think I had like small little bits and pieces falling away or, yeah. or, or uh, what do you say? Like, the whale a little bit here and there is falling away and you see something you didn't really recognize consciously before. And the strange thing is my ex-wife, she's Romanian, I'm Swiss, we live in Denmark. And when I got to know her here in Denmark at school, she, she told me of how she could feel and see where her sister is, or once at least, uh, like really see through her eyes and feel the feelings. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. And now with all these different, you know, small awakenings and Joe Dispenza, Greg Braden, and, and so on and so forth, right? All these, uh, yeah, uh, Michael Beckwith and so on and so forth, all these teachings. I'm like, wow, how was I so interested in my ex-wife? Yeah, because she was open to this other world, to the spiritual world, to this connection. So I think it was just these little things where I opened up more and more and I lost a job here. I couldn't find another job there. I did the study here. I had a burnout there. I had a depression. Um, and, and, and nothing really seemed to work. I couldn't find anything. I got, of course, very negative. It must be very hard for, you know, for a partner to be around. Um, so that separated us. And then Corona came. And I was like, no, I'm not going to take a vaccine. No, I'm not going to do this. And, uh, you know, eventually it was like, enough is enough. So... So that's why I ask you if Corona was one, one of your reasons for the divorce, uh, but not. So it was also kind of the awakening process. Yeah, it was. It was. And for me too, I mean, I know a divorce is a big deal, but it honestly, and we, don't get me wrong, we had many, many beautiful memories together. We had a really great time together being married. There were so many beautiful memories that we had. But I, too, asked the question, like you said, like, why was I attracted to him? Well, we were, we were in the same place. You know, we were an energetic match when we came together. And he really was open in many ways about many things, but to an extent. Um, and so. The, it's kind of like I knew intuitively that it was coming and I honestly feel like I was unconsciously preparing. I feel like the reason I became a nurse was because I knew I was going to need something else and I wasn't going to be able to just, you know, be a stay-at-home mom anymore, that I was going to need something else. I didn't ever have this, like, I'm going to become a nurse because I've got to divorce this man. It wasn't like that at all. Um but it was so what happened for me, you know, I slow I started to evolve slowly and I already kind of knew that he probably wasn't going to come with me. But then it got really loud that he was not open to the evolution. And for me, the number one, the first part of the evolution was to stop drinking alcohol. Now, um, I will drink 
a glass of wine or something every once in a while now. But even then, I'm like, it's still, it feels very unaligned for me. Um, so eventually that will probably completely go. But when I knew, when he was not going to like even do that, I was like, okay, this can't, this can't go on because there were so many unsafe situations that were happening because of the alcohol. And it's like, at some point you grow up, right? Well, that's the, that's, that's ideal because we were wild together, you know, in our twenties, but I grew up and he didn't want to grow up. Peter Pan syndrome, you know? And so I needed something to support me because I was walking around just pissed off at the world. I was like you. I was very angry. Like I was, I, and I know that I wasn't a joy to be around for the kids. I was bitter and I was pissed off because I thought, why? Like, why doesn't he want to be married to me? Catch. <laughs> why do I don't want it? Why won't he change for me? Right. Why won't he change for me? You can't change anyone. And so, you know, instead of going crazy, I went inward. And I adopted a mantra. Wayne Dyer taught me that. That was the, no, the first shift I made was a mantra. And my mantra was, I am healthy, wealthy, and beautiful. And it changed my life. So instead of mowing the yard pissed off because I was mowing and he should have been there mowing or packing the boxes and being pissed off because I was doing it alone. I stopped that negative thought pattern. And I just said all, all the time, I constantly said to myself, I'm healthy, wealthy, and beautiful. I'm healthy, wealthy, and beautiful. I'm healthy, wealthy. Every step I took, every counter, I am healthy, wealthy, and beautiful. And, and it changed everything, everything. So, I mean, it, it pushed also away these other thoughts, these negative, destructive thoughts, I would say. And, oh, yeah. And, and I, I just see this reflection of what you said in my life and other people's life is like, yeah, but we agreed to do this. We agreed to do that. I mean, I was home because, yeah, as I told, I couldn't really find a job after I was fired twice in a short period. I was told I will be fired two or three weeks after my daughter was born, so my first child. So there must be some traumas there, some limiting beliefs, um, you know, to be a successful business person and father. Uh, yeah. Because my father still struggles to show emotions and, uh, and I know how much my father suffered because of his father and stuff like that. So I think I want to be the best emotional, present father doing things with the kids, you know, play the games, do the creative work, do the whatever crazy stuff. And it blocks me. Right. So, and then probably when, when my, my daughter was born, I was subconsciously self sabotaging. I don't know. Because two jobs were like, boom, gone. And then I was home. And I also got this frustration because I was cleaning. Like, when the kids were bigger, when we had two kids and I was working out, I had weeks where I was washing five to eight times and washing, hanging up, putting them back in the closet, sometimes vacuuming uh, before the dog died. Um, walking the dog, shopping. I didn't cook because that's something, since I had a family where I don't feel comfortable. Before, when I was alone, no issue. Something with the more, being more aware, suddenly I'm blocking myself. You know, the, I'm more aware about the health issues and suddenly I have a hard time to know what to eat. And mm. it doesn't mean I'm eating better, right? I'm blocking myself. So, and, and that was my ex-wife's point. At least she chose, like, you're not cooking. And I'm like, yeah, but you don't see all the other work I did. And then you get aggressive uh, for no reason uh, instead yeah. of loving yourself. And I can see it. It's much easier now. Uh, the energy between us is much better. And uh, like you said, right, it's, it's the self-love, uh, the self-acceptance. Yeah, how do you practice self-love? Now you said you had the Wayne Dyer uh, mantra. Uh, is there anything else like for self-love, self-acceptance, something, you know, that worked for you? Yeah. Taking time for myself. That was the number one thing for me as a single mom was to stop and allow myself the space to do what I felt good doing. And that varies for everyone. For me, my number one non-negotiable that I 
I will do every single day is I will meditate and do some form of breath work every single day. And when I was still working at the hospital, if I did not meditate before I went to work, it was a real struggle to make it through the day. And so what I found was as I would gift myself, before I even recognized it really as a gift to myself, when I would say, okay, this feels very unnatural to me because the silence and the stillness feels very unnatural to us as we are raised in a nonstop <laughs> instant gratification society. But I started with, I, I could only meditate for two minutes at a time when I first started meditating. So I had my mantra, right? So I keep my mind filled when I was doing all the things that I was doing, still saying busy. And then when I was introduced to meditation, I remember what Abraham Hicks said about meditation that really stuck with me as she said, when someone tells me they do not have 15 minutes to meditate, I tell them you need to meditate for an hour then. <laughs> And you know, I heard the same thing from Tim Ferriss. I, I think now he was more or less my way gate to self-improvement. In, in one of his episodes, he's also talking about, you know, self-care, breath work, uh, fasting, uh, you know, like always like how to improve uh, beyond what is, uh, you know, feasible or what we think it's feasible. And he also said, well, if you cannot meditate for 15 minutes, you need uh, three hours to meditate, not only one hour. Yeah. And it, this is stuck in my head. And I think that must be eight, nine years now. So I love that. So how, how did you start uh, when you say this, this, this silence was dif mm -hmm. difficult? It was unknown. It was strange. How, how did you start into the meditation? How did you keep it up a routine? Because I think that's a big issue to keep it a routine. Yeah. You really do it every day. Yeah. Well, I, in the beginning, I just had to sit down and make myself do it. And I would sit down for two minutes and I would just be as quiet as I could. And I would have to count my breaths. I mean, I would have to have a point of focus. Otherwise, my mind would stray. And my mind would stray and I would just come back. I would just come back every time, you know, always coming back to the heartbeat or to the count. And then it, would, it slowly started to stretch where I could do five minutes and then I could do 10 minutes and then I could do 30 minutes. And so what I found is as I would really allow myself, as I would love myself enough to give myself time, my kids would see what I was doing and they saw, they could make a connection between my meditation and my behavior. And so... There were times where they would actually say to me, did you meditate today? They, would, they could tell when I wasn't making the space for me. And they would actually say, please go meditate. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Either this is very much compassionate, compa uh, compassionate or uh, it's very like, you know, finger in your face. Like, hey, uh, you annoy me. Please uh, take your time. <laughs> Mom. Take the time to meditate. and so. That evolved into a practice now where when I meditate, I really like a good solid hour oh, wow. of meditation, a good solid hour. I'm addicted, fully addicted. It's amazing. Um, I do it at first thing in the morning, typically before James has to go to school. I'll wake up. I don't, you know, Joe Dispenza will tell you to sit up. Well, I break that rule because if I move, if I stir in the house, then the kids are up for the most part, especially my little guy. So I just, I wake up about an hour before we have to start getting him ready for school, set an alarm. I stay in bed and I meditate while I'm in bed. Um, and the reason that it becomes so addictive is, then this is enough of a reason, is because it feels so good. But you also start to experience the health benefits of meditation, you know, your, your, your body regulates, it changes your physical expression to the world and your world rearranges around you. And you, when you meditate in the morning and go throughout your day, 
is everything always perfect? No. You know, we're living in a 3D world. We're all bumping up against each other. But I'll give you a specific example of the power of meditation. When I was a, when I was a nurse, so in the hospital setting, there are times where in America, we call it a code situation where someone is dead or actively dying and we call a code and it's the nurse who comes in and typically finds the patient that is in a code situation. And so the nurse has to be on her toes. She's got to be ready. She's got to know, you know, what do I need to administer to the patient? What is the process here? If I discover the patient, I'm the, I'm the leader. I'm the team leader. You know, you've got to coordinate all of that. And what happens when you're in that situation, right? You have fight or flight. Well, you can't fly as a nurse. You've got to fight. And so you have that sympathetic nervous system response come in where your heart starts racing, your palms start sweating, you start shaking, and you are in a situation where it is highly emotionally charged and you have to focus. You have to be the calm decision maker. I was very good at that because I was experienced, but I still had the physiological response of the increased heart rate in A, B, and C. Now, afterwards, after a code experience would happen, most nurses will walk throughout the entire day in a space of kind of, you're kind of fritzed out, right? It stresses your nervous system and your heartbeat continues to race for a little while. You're shaky for a little while, sometimes for hours after this happens, because the way the hospital system is, there's no like decompression, right? There's none of that because everything is too moving too fast, but that's a whole nother conversation. And so what I noticed when I started meditating consistently is that when a code situation would happen, my thought process was far more clear. My reaction time was way faster my heart rate was not racing. And if it was elevated after the experience, I would go back into baseline immediately. And everyone else was walking around shaking, freaking out. Yeah, that, that brings another question. Of course, uh, you already mentioned the hospital system. Why are we getting so stressed when someone dies? Uh, I had a talk with a Native American from Mexico, Aztec Indian, and you know, when someone dies, it, they die in their home and people come and visit, they look at it, the kids look at it, and they're buried at their home because that's where they live. Yeah. Uh, and we are just so disconnected from everything. Yes, I agree with you. The goal is to live typically, right? And so we have a medical, we have a, um, a document that people fill out when they come into the hospital. And either you say, don't resuscitate me do resuscitate me if I die. The majority of the patients choose to res resuscitate. And so that's our goal is we go in to, to save the life, even if it could be a very low quality of life. We're not assessing that the time of a code situation. We're not assessing what is the quality of life. We're not balancing weighing any of that. We're doing what legally we're supposed to do as the care providers. Uh, okay, so so people walk around nervous also if you, yeah, put life back into the dead person's body. So it was not because you find someone dead and now the person is dead and has to be, the, the family has to be informed and everything. It's it's more like the, the yeah. process of trying to relive. Or, uh, relive oh, something. yes. Yeah. It It is the conversations around transition. You know, it's all based in medicine. It's all based in profit. And so that takes me to a point around being a bone marrow transplant nurse. I saw a lot of futile treatments. Um, and I'm not going to, to judge. I don't necessarily know what the intention of the doctor was in all these situations because there were some really great doctors that had pure intentions that I worked with. But I saw a lot of futile treatments. I saw a lot of people who would have had a much higher quality of life and a, probably a longer life, actually, definitely a longer life with a higher quality if they had gone home and, of course, gone the holistic route. But even that aside, if they'd gone home and allowed the disease and they just lived their life the way that it was, they would have had a longer, higher quality life than if they would gone, had gone through the treatments that 
were given at the hospital. Yeah, and you work there. So it, it's not something you just hear from somewhere, it's you work there. And I've heard the same, right? L many of the treatments are killing the people, not the cancer itself. Um, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. It is a very backward system. And I will, I do want to make one point. I don't know why I feel called to make this point, but it's big for me, is I never hung a bag of chemo on that unit. I was always nursing a baby. <laughs> you can't hang chemo in the U.S. anyway while you're nursing a baby. And that was intentional. I just kept nursing babies. <laughs> I just kept having kids and nursing kids. <laughs> and that was a big part of the reason why I actually left that unit is because my female boss asked me, don't you think it's time <laughs> to stop nursing? Aren't you there yet? And I was like, wow, it's time for me to go. Oh, yeah. So that's like the intuitive hinge. Wow. Yeah. Very good. Um, so you, you have described a little bit before, after meditation. So before meditation, before I started meditating, I can see you were more nervous, more agitated. And afterwards you were more calm mm -hmm. and more clear headed. You also yes. mentioned about your ex-husband and you, you were drinking a lot and partying a lot. And now it feels a little bit out of balance with alcohol. And um, yeah, I, I've never really felt cold to alcohol. So that's why people call me old soul, perhaps. I don't know why. But I, whenever I tried alcohol, it didn't work out. And yes, we had wine glasses and stuff. And I like a really dark red wine, but um, also before we got divorced, I could see my ex-wife wanted to drink more and more alcohol, which was like strange because mm -hmm. we didn't drink that much, right? So she started inviting her friends, drinking alcohol at 10 o'clock at night and stuff like that. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. This is completely backwards. <laughs> um, because for me, mm -hmm. even now thinking of alcohol, I have a bottle of red wine I got in March or April. I haven't opened it yet <laughs> because it does it feels wrong um yeah did that with the alcohol start after you started meditating or did you just like after a few months of meditating suddenly feel like i don't want that alcohol anymore so my journey with alcohol has been really interesting because i have a lot of alcoholics in my family so i'm definitely working with ancestral oh you know like lineage with working with lineage here and moving through this issue with alcohol, um, as so full disclosure, as a as a pretty young kid, I started drinking, and I would drink. I would hang out with the kids at high school that were the drinkers, and we drank. And I went to college, and I drank. And when I was twenty one, I moved to Los Angeles to be an actress. <laughs> which it took me six months to figure out that was not where I wanted to be. Um, <laughs> And I partied and I had a great time. And then well, honestly, once I started having kids, that's when that all slowed for me. So I had my first child when I was 25 and her birth story, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, but I, that's when the alcohol really started slowing for me. However, uh, when you live with someone who is a heavy drinker, um, it was, it was a bit like I would go through periods where I would just party for a while but I was never once I started having kids I never was like I never really got drunk like I would I would have a few but I never got out of control um but still that still would not suffice you know it still created issues for us it, you know for him and I it still created health issues it still created you know frequency issues <laughs> and so Really throughout our entire marriage, which was 13 years, we did this ebb and flow um, of peace and drama, peace and drama, peace and drama. And then um, toward the end of our marriage, about six, you know, around six years ago, um, this is when I was like, I have to completely stop drinking because I want to support him to stop drinking. And so this whole guilt and shame came in very deep wounding around perfectionism. I felt like I needed to be perfect in order to be right, in order to be heard and seen because there were people in my life, in particular in his family, they, I felt like they weren't seeing my rightness, <laughs> you know, that ego would be right. And that really didn't matter. But, but 
uh, I was the safe parent. I was the safe parent. That was the bottom line. I was the safe parent and I wanted to be seen for that. And I wanted to be seen for my perfectionism and my strength, you know? Um, and so it, that's been a quite a meandering path for me as once we got divorced, I did still drink and I, I would, you know, drink casually and enjoy myself in that way. But I still, it still didn't feel right. And then really once I started leaning into, uh, you know, like supporting people on their healing journey, that's when most of it fell away. I don't keep alcohol in my house. I, I don't go buy alcohol. Um, typically if I, and I don't, really don't go out. Typically if I'm, for instance, the last time I drank a beer was um, last weekend, I had a beer with my aunt and my grandma. With your grandma? I had a, <laughs> my aunt and my grandma. And my grandma drinks a beer maybe once a year. So, no, actually grandma didn't drink a beer. She didn't have, me and my aunt had a beer together. And that's it. So it still doesn't feel fully aligned, <laughs> um, you know, like, and that's because when you're holding so much light, you, you don't want that. Yeah. Um, but I had a beer. So what? Part yeah. of my journey to not judging myself and not be such a perfectionist. Yeah. We, we don't have to be perfect. Um, beautiful. Yeah, but I, I, I can see that. And I can see now with all the discussion we had, how, how you and your husband came together and why it separated. Uh, yeah. But that's the way it is. And I, I know there's also many stories where people were partying. I mean, um, there's uh, Mind Valley I'm following. And I started with the 12, 12, 12 uh, Way Smart or something like that. Um, He's the son of some cartoon, which is very famous. And he was partying, drugs, all that kind of stuff. Going to business meeting, being yeah. full. And then he had to burn out. And I guess his wife was probably also partying. And it was a really big depression he had. And he came out of it. And both are, at their, I think they're 60 now. And they look awesome. Or 55. But they look awesome because they both changed. They both stopped with smoking, with drugs, with unnecess not unnecessary partying. Uh, all these things, but they change together. Uh, and I guess it, it depends. Again, it's for me, sometimes it's difficult to understand. We say we are in a multiverse or uh, we, we, we have free will, but we don't have free will. We came for a purpose. We have an agreement before we come to planet Earth. We are meant to meet a few people. We are meant to meet other people we are perhaps to meet. And so I, I'm sure like, you had three kids, right? So I'm sure you were meant to meet your ex-husband and I am I was meant to meet my ex-wife. Uh, but it's it yeah. kind of weird. It's It doesn't really <laughs> go up with me. So, like, okay, you're, you're meant to meet and then you're just meant to hurt yourself. But yeah, so so it's like a lesson learned, right? To, to learn, yeah. still in love, it's still good. It's still, everything is fine, even if it hurts a lot. Yeah. So, you know, what comes up for me when you talk about the alcohol and the journey that we're, that we are, that we said yes to on this earth plane is, you know, we came to really transmute a lot of these old templates, all, a lot of these old ways of being, right? And so we look at how deeply entrenched the practice of alcohol, like so many people drink, it's so socially accepted. You know, we, we celebrate uh, a hard work week by poisoning ourselves with alcohol. It, yes. it doesn't make sense. It's backwards, isn't it? It doesn't make sense. And so we came to shine a light on that. And those who are ready, come on, let's go. We'll go together. Those who are not, we love them and give them a pillow and a blanket and say, okay, you go on and stay asleep and that's fine. Uh, but I'm going to be very careful about engaging with your energy. And so... What I have found very empowering on this journey is to release the need to know as much as I can and just be in love. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I feel like on this journey, I have decided upon a divine path for myself, my higher self, my oversoul said, okay, 
this is what we want to experience through Monica and this fractal of that bigger part of us, that higher self. I said yes to it. And I laid out a divine path. And so my path is here, but I can divert from that path. I can divert from that path for a little while. I can really divert from that path as much as I want. And the more I divert from that path, the louder the nudge is going to be to get back on path. And eventually you're going to get kicked in the shin if you don't get back on that path. And so this is where the pain gets big, right? This is where the pain gets bigger is when we decide to stray from the path because we came, I believe, that we came to support Mother Earth to raise her frequency. You know, we came for self first because we have to overflow in that. But we are the volunteers who came back to shift everything. We said yes to it. And so I have a mission and I will live out that mission. And the divine destination, it's there. I'm already there. It is there. And that is where I'm going, where I am now, all at the same time, which is very confusing. But we get lost sometimes, but we'll always get pulled back to that divine path. And the, the people we are divinely meant to meet, to teach us lessons, you know, they will always come through. And what we're shifting in this earth experience is the need for pain and suffering. You know, that we're cultivating within ourselves the love, the deep love, so that we can know that we don't have to grow through pain and suffering all the time or ever. We can grow through love itself and, and beautiful experiences. And that's a dense, yes. dense program to support ourselves and others to shift out of. Wow. Yeah. You just answered my question I had in the head, like, you know, like this, do we really need to go through the pain and suffering to, to grow? And then he just answered it at the end. You know, now we, we have talked a lot about your nursing background, but you're working now as a certified quantum healer and conscious wealth mentor, a reality bender. How did this transition really start? I mean, yeah, we know three years ago you didn't want to be vaccinated and stabbed and mm -hmm. you were left, you were let go. So, and then what, what happened then? Did you, did you have something on the site already that you worked with or were you just without anything? You know, it's so interesting how this all worked out. I moved with the kids into a different house and we had had this water system at the previous house and we were now in a rental property. And so the water that we were drinking, I was like, well, what kind of water do I, you know, I had a filtration system in the other house. Like, what do I, what do I do now? So I was still working as an RN, as a nurse. And I just very gently put out to the universe, can you show me what I'm supposed to do about our water source? Because we were drinking bottled water and that didn't feel good or right, but I didn't know what to do. And when you're in a rental property, kind of, you can't just go installing a big system, right? And so that's just a side note. I just put that with no resistance. I put that thought out into the universe and went about life still working as an RN. And I was on Facebook and I started to observe my behavior in the online space. Yeah, that scroll, that mindless scroll. And I started to observe who am I engaging with, right? Because something else we learn on this journey is that we are the company we keep. What are the messages that we're taking in every day, all day? Are they elevating us or are they, you know, constricting us? And so I started to cultivate a Facebook feed that was high vibration. People didn't necessarily know them, but if I saw them come up, I would say, oh, I like that. I'm going to follow this person. And so um, this is, then my wheels, and I'm going to plant another seed here. Then my wheels started turning about, I know I'm supposed to be in the online space. How can I, but what do I do? Like, how, how can I do this? So I started like, I did an Amazon drop ship. And that was not 
that did not resonate with me. That was not fulfilling at all. And then I asked the universe again with very little resistance. Can you just show me? Can you just deliver someone in a very simple way? Like, what, what do you want me to do in the online space? So I'm on Facebook and I'm scrolling. I find this beautiful woman named Brooke W. March. And she was doing a work, a free workshop around money, your money vibration. and. Oh, I knew my work around money was deep and wide with all of the religious programming. And I grew up with, we weren't poor, but we were middle class, always, you know, paycheck to paycheck, just lots of messaging around scarcity and rich people are bad and all of those, uh, all those stereotypical, you know, thoughts that we grew up with. And so I thought, oh, well, this, I definitely need this. This would, this would be great. I need to work on my money vibration. And so I went in and there was this three-day workshop that I did around money. And it just opened my eyes to the possibility of like, okay, it's, it, this is a tool. And I need to get my vibration right around this because I want to live a life of joy and freedom with my kids. I don't want to be stuck in a hospital all the time. And so I went through her course and I knew, I thought, what is she doing in the background? Like, how is she actually sustaining this? Because I know she's not doing free workshops to buy food and go on vacation. And so she, this is when she said, um, I'll invite you to day, to day four if you want to know how I'm sustaining my online mission. And I was like, all right, I'm, I'm all in. Let me see. So I come back the next day and she starts talking about, and I'm curious if you've heard about this, Kangen water or Kangen. Kangen, Kangen water. So this is a, um, a water system. This is the water system that I was looking for. So without going into depth about it, it is a Japanese medical grade system that sits on your counter. It's in Japanese hospitals. So my nurse light was like ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and it creates a uh, hydrogen rich, um, alkalized water. So it's healing water. And so I just all my whole body felt the yes, my whole body felt the yes. And I was like, and it's a grassroots movement. So, um, you know, there is no advertising like the distributors are the ones who build this business and it's very lucrative, but it's high integrity. It's conscious. That was the kicker for me because I wasn't going to do anything that wasn't serving the earth or my own soul. I was done compromising my values in, in the hospital. And so I, I was like, all right, I'm all in. I went all in, um, which means I got a device myself and then started using attraction marketing and using the system that they had to teach you how to have an online business. And I mean, I, I was still a nurse. I would get up in the morning, do my meditation, go to work at, on my lunch break that we don't typically get as, an art, as a nurse. I would create my own lunch break. I would go to my car and I started my journey in the online space with the book, The Magic. <laughs> Do you know the book, The Magic by Rhonda Byrne? Uh, no, but I'm sure I've heard it. It's a gratitude book. And so this is what is recommended by those who have created this educational space for me to build my business with this product is the recommendation was that you start your business by doing a gratitude journey. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is really resonating now. <laughs> and so... Um, that I did a 28 day gratitude journey online. I would go live every single day. It absolutely terrified me because I was not doing anything online before. And I would, I was walking everyone through this 28 day gratitude journey. And as time passed and I was able to create the income that I needed to create to replace being an RN, I wasn't quite there, but eight months into the business, I went into work and I was berated by my by my um, boss in front of staff, all of the staff who loved me and appreciated me because I was like the shining light in the building, always lifting people up, always the friendly face, always working my butt off, doing the absolute best for the patients. And it was that, se you know, that second wave of COVID coming in. It was right about there. And what happened is, uh, after he, after I maintained my calm and stayed neutral and he talked to me like an animal, I walked out of the morning meeting that he's never at. He just happened to be there that morning. I walked out and I looked at him and I said, 
you will have my resignation by the end of the day. <laughs> and his, re his response to me was, I look forward to it. My intuition said to me, do not take report on the night because what happens as an RN, if you take report on the patients, they become yours and you can actually get in big trouble. They can take your license for patient abandonment is what they call it. So my intuition said to me, do not take report on those nurses. And I was like, so I just stood there for a moment. Uh, my heart started racing. I, I breathed through that. I did not say anything back. I walked into the supply room and I got my mask and my shield and my gown. And I walked by him again and I looked at him and he just looked at me with the most unappreciative, mean look I perhaps have ever experienced in my life. And so I sat my stuff down on the counter and I took my badge off and I threw it. Not at him, but toward him on the ground. Which is very out of character for me. And I said, I quit. And I walked outside and I got in my car and I just bawled my eyes out. And I thought, oh shit, this is it. Like, this is, there's no turning back because I knew I was not going to turn back. That would not serve me on the highest. This was the beginning of a brand new life for me. And I was going to support as many people as possible to make a change and hold the line and claim their sovereignty and stand in their power. And that's when the online journey really began because that's when I went all in and began doing a little bit of healing and coaching and really providing a inexpensive space for people to hold the space to just be the illuminator for those who are ready to heal and I basically weave that into my conk and water that's how I support all of my mission work that's how I'm able to offer inexpensive healing spaces for people because I can I'm not grinding from one thing to the next as a coach or a healer it's no longer about dollar for hour exchange for me because I have the spaciousness that my soul gets to create what my soul wants to create for the highest and greatest good of all. So I'm all for highest wealth and highest good, highest wealth, highest good for all. Okay. So that's, that's the transition. I, while I listen to you, I'm like, did I misunderstand? Did they praise you for being a good person and then being annoyed or, or did I misunderstand something? Am I? Um, so, okay. Um, so I will be super open about my belief and why I'm, I was um, intentionally pushed out. Managers were getting bonuses for the percentage of those that got vaccinated. There was a bullseye on my back. So the berating had nothing to do with my coworkers. It was the manager who was receiving the bonus. And I was not part of the lining of his pocket. That was the issue. Okay. Money rules the world, which should not be. It should be consciousness and love and uh, helping it. Right. And so, so my boss and I, he didn't like me because I was not silent in standing up for my patients or standing up for myself. I was not willing to just go with the next best policy and just implement blindly. I was always asking questions. I was always advocating for myself and I was always advocating for the patients and my coworkers. He didn't like, it. I wasn't quiet. I did not blindly follow. I was not a sheep. Is that something you have always been like that as a kid, teenager? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, oh, yeah, always. I've always, and anyone will tell you that, anyone that grew up with me, I've always been a jump in the fire kind of person. Uh, but I never, but never at the expense of anyone else's, uh, highest good, you know, okay, so was, I will I always go forward fearlessly in a way that will serve myself and others. And I've always, I've always been like that. <laughs> so you basically, um, burned your fingers once in a while. 
before that. Uh, yes. But yep. when, when you look back now uh, through the life, <clears throat> besides the, the job as a nurse, was it always kind of for the, the higher good, you know, that you burned your fingers and something else opened up, like friends were falling off because they were not good for you because you were honest yeah. and direct? Absolutely. Yes. And I still, <laughs> I still experience this, but the difference is I navigate the world with more grace because of the love that I have for myself and because of the time that I take for myself. And so, for instance, in the past, when I would move into the fire, sometimes the it would get kind of loud and and big and ugly, right? Like, so the way that I, the experience that I have with my um, boss at work, right? Today, uh, because I am deeper in the belief, uh, not deeper in the belief, deeper in the embodiment of really, really seeing the light in everyone and even seeing the light in my former boss. I don't hold anything against him. He changed my life. <laughs> he was, he came and taught me perhaps one of the greatest lessons to stand up for myself. Fred, thank you, Fred. If you're watching this, I love you. He catapulted me into a completely new life. That wasn't an accident, right? That was divine. My experience with him was divine. And so even as I'm navigating and I have, I, I don't have a lot of close friends in the physical because that hasn't happened yet. I, a lot of people have fallen away, but that naturally happened over the years. Um, but for instance, I have a recently cut off a friendship because um, we just were not aligned anymore. And she had some real issues with trust. And she actually, she thought I wanted to sleep with her ex-husband. <laughs> yeah, but that's in the insecurities, right? It's like insecurities. But, and this is where, how we get to view it. And so I could have, and so my point is, I could have been all up in arms. Oh, how could you believe how would you believe that I would do something like that? I would never. Haven't I shown you my loyalty? Don't you see my character? No, that's not how I approached it. I just saw myself out of the situation. I said, I'm going to go now. And no, you don't, you don't get to treat me like this. I love myself more than that. And so I'm going to see myself out of this situation. And I'm going to see myself out of this relationship. But I did it in a loving way. And yeah. I just way yeah, so it's not it felt the, great so it's not this fiery element um it's more yeah, a, a yeah. balanced element uh more yeah so you walk your life more conscious you see the signs oh, better yeah. than before as i can see so as a teenager yeah. young adult before you had kids you didn't really see these signs i guess it was just living from day to day and you know the material yeah, world it was and it was, and it was about, it was about the world happening to me, not for me. And now I recognize it's all happening for me. And every experience I say, observe, what is this teaching me? What am I meant to learn out of this? What am I teaching myself? Because I manifested this situation. What am I teaching myself in this situation? And that is so empowering. It can be a little annoying sometimes. Okay. But and we get to talk that we get to have the fullness of our experience. And we're allowed to be annoyed and pissed off sometimes, but you don't become the emotion, right? You allow it to flow through you and leave you and see what is the learning experience. So so how how do you ask yourself uh when when a situation happens? What I, what is the process? What is the method? What is the ritual? What is the whatever you want to call it? When you get into a situation, you're like, oh my God, what is just happening? I mean, can be, we, we always think of the negative things, but it's also of the yep. positive things. So uh, can, you, can you guide the listeners through a situation like that? How, how they can ask themselves? I mean, there might be someone which never really, you know, just starts to stumble and looks for, you know, these kind of talks where people talk about there's more than the material world. Yeah, I can give you a specific experience that, happened recently this was the big experience that came up for me that 
we needed to shift this timing. So my grandmother, who I'm very close with, asked me if I would consider living with her because she's getting to an age now where she is still safe, but she's getting a little weaker. She's having some memory issues. And we've had this running joke for years about living together. And not long ago, just a few days ago, she said to me, would you seriously consider that? And I said, absolutely. I would love for us to have the time together for the kids to be with you. I think that would be a, an amazing experience. And then we were thinking about, as we're thinking about the logistics of this, who else is involved? There, she has two kids, so my uncle and my mom. And so we're talking about, before we go to them, let's just talk about how are they going to feel about this? And she said, oh, well, I don't think they'll, I don't think they'll care. And I said, I'm feeling that too. I'm having uh, an intuition about perhaps a little bit of resistance from one of them, but we'll, let, we'll trust and then we'll navigate that if that comes up. And so what happened is there was resistance and there was actually a really strong knee-jerk reaction from my uncle around this and it got very not nice. He was very mean to her. I was not on the phone. I don't know what was said. And I didn't ask because all I needed to know is it didn't feel good to grandma. And when she called me and told me about this, I said, grandma, I am so sorry that you are experiencing pain through this process. This process is meant to be fun. And I said, so let's talk about maybe why he had that reaction. And so I explained to her, I said, I know that anger is a mask for sadness. And so let's, even though his behavior was not okay, let's kind of look at what he may be experiencing just to hold the light for him and to help soften his heart. And so without going to him and witnessing him, we were able to energetically witness him together the two of us. And so many things are happening here, right? We're literally shifting ancestral timelines. We are uh, supporting grandma and what she's moving through, supporting me, and then supporting him and his inner child. And so I didn't go super deep with my grandma because it, it wasn't like fully aligned to go that deep with her, but, but the energy was all there. And our higher selves were all congregating. And so instead of saying to her, what an asshole, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, what a jerk. I cannot believe he did that to you. This is not okay. I'm going to call him. I'm going to message him. We're going to get all of the warriors on board and we're going to crush him. Yeah, standard no. standard behavior. As yes. Many people And so what? so what, when she told me that, First of all, I was like, oh, my intuition is on. Like, I already knew. I knew that something was coming up, which means perhaps I created that, right? I'm feeding into that. But anyway, so when she told me that, I thought, okay, because he did a 180. At first, he was supportive, and then he got to thinking about it, and he did a 180. And so instead of throwing daggers at him, I thought, oh, my gosh, how can I love him through this? What is this teaching me? How is this teaching me to love unconditionally? And I thought, he thinks he's going to lose his mom. He thinks that I'm going to stow. And, and even though it's a completely unreasonable thought, it was his inner child. He was like going back to childhood, you know, like a little boy without his mother. And so I don't want to judge that experience. I want to hold him in the fullness of his experience without coddling him or sacrificing myself. And so I didn't reach to him at all. My ego wanted to, but I didn't do it. I, I, I sat at the end of the conversation with my grandma and we ended up meeting up in the physical. I hugged her and I said, Grandma, we're going to release this to God. And we're going to trust. We're going to shine the light on him. We're going to picture the light shining on him. And we're going to trust that his heart is going to soften. 
I went home. Actually, I went to my mom's after that. And my mom used to be my person that would prove my rightness and tell me how right I was. And we would get all fired up together. We didn't do that. We called in the ancestors. I said, mom, we're going to call in grandpa. We're going to call in the ancestors. And she was like, okay, okay. Because she, she's opening up. She's like, all right, let's do it. So and it wasn't a big to do. We literally stood there and said, we are invoking. We are calling in the support of our ancestors. Paul, as we called him, Paul. Paul, we are calling in a divine intervention that my uncle may feel the unconditional love and see that this is the highest and greatest good for all and his heart may be softened. Tell you what, not even an hour later, he texted me and said, I'm on board. He said, it took me a little while to graduate to the idea, but I know you have the best intention for grandma and I'll do whatever I can to help. And I'm not exaggerating. Less than an hour later. Wow. Like, so so when, when I listen to you, it sounds a little bit like the exercise you did with your kids, right? Sitting together and then, um, is it just talking or are you going, trying to go in a lower brainwave state? Tita, te whatever, beta, um, whatever. Well, um, I did not do that with my mom but I did do that with my, on my own. So there was also, um, between the time that he flipped the switch and the time that, that he texted me, um, there was an, there was a night. So he, I got the call from grandma, heard what was going on, held the space. I had a night to myself. And then I went and saw grandma in the physical. And then we called on the ancestors. But that night I did a very, very deep meditation. Um, I actually, went into the Sophia code. Great book. I went, I, so I, I met it. So the long and short of it is that night I meditated and I had the most intense experience in my breathwork session that night. It's like the ancestors knew they were going to be called on. And I'm telling you, they were already rearranging the timeline. I could see it. I could see the sacred geometry and the feathers and, and uh, the, the swirls of energy moving and shifting all night long. I didn't sleep that night. I was like, oh, I was dizzy. I was like, oh, this is intense, but I'm, I'm here for the ride. I'm here for the ride. So what appears to have power has none. What appears to have no power has all of the power. So you, you said something about breath. That means you made a breath work with meditation. So something, yes. something like for the people which watch, we, we all know Wim Hof like, uh, or, yes. you know, like pranayama, mm -hmm. what, yep. what it, was it more an active breath uh, or, or how do you combine that? Wim Hof is a little intense for me. <laughs> I like to stay a little bit more in my feminine, although sometimes I'm up for a good Wim Hof session. Um, <laughs> but I, what I do is a little, uh, softer. And so I'll tell you specifically what I did. There is an app called other ship, just like it sounds O T H E R S H I P other ship. Um, it is an app and it's also on YouTube. I love, I love this app. I did a breath work called Third Eye. It's a 52 minute breath work that takes you through, uh, deep breathing at a certain rate, uh, pranayama, like you mentioned, um, takes you through a little more intense breath work and then also takes you through that hold where you drive the energy up to your pineal gland. So it's, it's a little bit of everything within that breath work. It's a 52 minute session. And at the very end of that breath work, it takes you through a guided meditation. So that's what I did. Okay. Yeah. Because another question for me was, you mentioned on one point, meditation, breath work at the same time. And then I was like, yeah, I, I noted breath work. So that came kind of hand in hand, breath work and meditation or for you? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't always do it at the same time. Um, but I, I did that night and I love it. I love that because, um, what happens on these, on other ship where they they actually kind of, they talk you through it. And so you have a point of focus and, you know, they're using that specific technique that really amplifies and gets you the maximum effect with the breath work, you know, as, as they're trained in what they do. Um, but something that I actually offer that is new to me that 
came through divinely in synchronicity with really all of this over the past few weeks is I actually do breathwork quantum healing sessions. Breathwork and quantum so, healing. <laughs> yeah, it's all amazing. It is next level. It's a simple breath that I call the surrender breath where you breathe in to the belly, into the chest, and then out all through the mouth. So it's... Oh. You do that while you're listening to a quantum heal. I'm literally taking you a channeled. I don't write it. It just channels through. I take you on a journey with your ancestors, maybe the elements, uh, your star family, and you're breathing the entire time as music and my voice is playing in the background. Cool. And at the very end, you just, you rest and I, I speak some affirmations to you. Woo! Talk about some shifting <laughs> that happened. It is profound. Now, I, I forgot to ask Esha about that uh, because she also has meditations, which are guided, but. Yes, and her meditations have, are cool. Yeah, I tried and she told me I just didn't do enough. In, in my interview with her, she said it took her 18 months of continuously what did you say? 45 minutes plus meditations day in, day out before something changed. And then she mm. apparently has really a lot of connections, uh, energetically speaking. But um, now that I have you here, how is it when you listen to your own guided meditations? Um, so in the beginning, I had a lot of resistance to it because I was constantly judging myself. I wasn't <laughs> even able to do it because I was like, oh, I should... I should have, you know, the music's too loud there. There was always some sort of, criti you know, I was criticizing myself. Um, that has fallen away. And I actually have been deeply, deeply called to be doing my own meditation. So it's funny that you ask that question because I do, I do my own meditations, especially those quantum healing breath works. It's sure. moving mountains for me. I, I, I took down a name in, um, webinar or healing week probably in the beginning of corona where all these things popped up right the three five days uh, 20 spiritual leaders and so on and so forth and he's an expert in sound healing i don't remember mm. the name and that's a bit annoying because i really want to talk to that guy for some reason it doesn't let me go this intuition is like talk to you know sound healing how does it work with the different frequencies and how do you find out your frequency and you know be he shared in this 45 minutes, one hour and a half, I don't remember how long, talk that he really went deep, deep because he goes deeper with himself than he does with his clients, right? He, he mm -hmm. has to test. Um, and he also shared something about your own voice, mm -hmm. that using your own voice gets you much deeper, yeah. right? That's why yes. I have as well. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's one thing for someone else to be see speaking to your subconscious, but wow, when you speak to your own subconscious, whew, it's very magical. So do you have also sublimin sublimin <laughs> subliminal uh, messages for yourself you listen to, you have recorded yourself or? Well, I actually consider these uh, breathwork quantum healing sessions, they are subliminal messages. Because what's happening is you're just trying to breathe. You're just trying to keep breathing. Uh, when you experience these, it's like sometimes you're on the journey consciously, but most of the time you're just focusing on the breath. And so when you're focusing on something else, then your subconscious is being spoken to. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. For, for me, it's like four months or four or five months since I did the last probably 45 to one hour breath work. I did the 21 day breath work exercise with Nier Shaik, I think it's called somatic health breath, uh, English dude, uh, from India, I think, or Thailand. I'm, I'm a bit confused. I thought he's Indian, then Thailand, but, um, uh, it, it's really interesting. And I also was in a man's retreat last summer where we were just laying on the Amazing. floor, uh, we had to take pullovers and covers with us because some people freeze, some people sweat, some people get quiet, some people start laughing, crying, shouting, whatever, whatever. That was yes. really, yeah, it's, I don't know why I don't get 
hooked to it because whenever I do it, I mean, it takes effort, right? It takes effort to yeah. sit down for 45 minutes, one hour, just says like, I, and that one with the man circle was like a circular breath. So you have the mouth open and you just keep on breathing all the time without stopping. Yes. Yes. And, uh, crazy. That's intense. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. I, I have to say, I'm never like, all right, it's time to do breath work. So excited for this. <laughs> Last night before I did my breath work, I was like, I just think about the amazing feeling that I get. I'm like, okay, it's where we're going, Monica. It's where we're going. Just it, just dive in and you're going. And um, I'm always so glad that I do. But I feel I feel you on the resistance. It it yeah, I get it. It's just do the work. I, I'm I'm I've been uploading a lot of old uh, videos because I didn't really upload them to YouTube. It was too complicated back then. Now with Descript and other AI tools, which pop up for the last 12 months, it's getting easier, right? So I thought like, I want to upload and I can see the message comes over and over again. Just do it. Uh, be res uh, not resistant, uh, keep um, consistent and just yes. do it, right? Uh, do the meditation every day, even if it's just five minutes in the morning, afternoon and evening. And when you can do more, you do more. Uh, do the breath work, whatever, once or twice a week. I also did Qigong and uh, my sister did some muscle testing. And she also told me at one point a few years back, uh, I should do like two times Qigong a week. I should do like two times Wim Hof breath a week. I should do like these and these things. And I didn't do it. And I had time, right? I was a home dad. And I think for me, it was, I felt bad being a home dad, not earning money. <laughs> I think that yeah. was another thing, right? So you search all the time instead of relaxing into the moment. And I heard that. Relaxing into the moment, that must be, yeah, about two and a half years ago from Spiritual Shit in one of her episodes. She said as soon as she learned to release and ease into the moment, uh, I think she was also married and divorced or just separated, that it's actually fun to be single. That it's okay to be in New York alone. And it's no problem that she doesn't have that money. As soon as she got happy with it and she felt at ease in it, things changed. She got invited here yeah. and there. She met her boyfriend, which is her, it's, which is the father of her daughter now, and all these things. It's kind of like relax into the moment. Don't resist it. See the positive. Yeah, acceptance. Acceptance. Yeah. Right. W which brings me to another question, which I didn't write down here. Uh, what are kind of mantras you use when you get into this stuck point? Why it's just like, poo, shit. Yeah. Um, I really just lean on like the om. Om. Sometimes I'll do the green Tara mantra. Om tare tu tare tu re soha. Or um, uh, Kuan Yin. Om mane padme hum. But I really just keep it simple. And so om is the sound of the universe, right? I've heard teachers, I don't know who it was, but I've heard a teacher anyway say, just chant the Om and all of your problems will dissolve. <laughs> because you're, you're calling to the universe. You're connecting with that divine flow. And the divine knows the greatest version of that which you desire that you really can't even comprehend. Like, you know, we, we think we want this certain thing or this certain experience, but there's even a greater version of that out there for us if we release the attachment to need it to be a certain way and we drop into trust and just, oh, mm -hmm. and I like to do it with my, I, when I do it, I close my teeth together because it creates a vibration. And this is part of the reason why they take our wisdom teeth out. Um, well, in America, I don't know if they do that there, but they remove your wisdom teeth in America. Anyway, uh, it creates a vibration in your teeth. And it just, it just resonates throughout your entire body, hits the pineal gland. It, and you sit and chant OM for about 15 minutes. You will feel it through your whole body. And I guarantee you, you will have some sort of maybe simple, but magical experience in your immediate surrounding. Okay. Well, when you talk about your wisdom teeth now, <laughs> your kids will uh -huh. have them or were they pulled? Um, they're all young enough that they, they all still have them. And I, I don't know, I don't really, I haven't yet had to look and understand all of that yet in depth. 
So well, I don't even think Sophia has her wisdom teeth in yet. Or she, I would know she would have told me. Um, and she's 16. So I'll cross that bridge. <laughs> I can't do it. I don't, I don't have them all. And I don't remember being pulled. So that just didn't grow. Um, Interesting. In my case. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's funny because I just went through my mouth. I'm like, oh, there's like a gap here. <laughs> So, <laughs> but I think I have three of them. At, at least one is missing. Uh, I should probably ask my dentist if I have three uh, wisdom uh, teeth. But I think in Switzerland or, yeah, in Switzerland, at least from my friends, they were pulled when they caused troubles, when they pushed too much on the, on the teeth. But mm. that brings me also to another documentary I've seen. It's like that Asian people which are chewing on chicken bones and heart stuff. They don't have issues with their teeth. They have enough space. They don't have crooked teeth. They have straight teeth, white teeth. It's us European and Americans which eat too soft, which are not chewing hard enough. Oh, yes, I've heard this too. So, yep. so now we sidetrack here again. Uh, yes, you know, <laughs> so much, isn't there? So much. It's, it's a lot. And I'm like, uh, wh where did I actually want to go? Um, so, yeah, I can... You know, when, when you talk about breath work and now I had Corona and I'm like, okay, forget about any breath work. Uh, it's already starting to irritate my, my chest. Just thinking of a breath yeah. work. Yeah. But, um, you said, you know, all the, the job titles you have certified quantum healer, conscious wealth mentor. So you have mentioned it, that you went to this money abundance uh, course. Mm -hmm. So is that where you learned to help others to change? shift their perception about money and wealth or did you learn um, it somewhere else i yes that's correct so I, I the seed was planted at that um in that space and then i went deeper and so really what is very important to me is as i learn which i learned through i'm in the beginning i learned the core foundation of how to create an online business but not how to do it just strategically, but also how to do it energetically, how to really activate the law of attraction, how to look at your leadership skills, um, at your, your money story is a really big one. Um, I actually have an educational platform that I work through called the Freedom Era. And when I first started my business, I was in the Freedom Era every single day, really building a foundation for the strategy and the energetics. Then once I started to embody those concepts, then I started creating my own offerings around empowering people around money, around their chakras, you know, like energy centers and, and like putting my own unique spin with my, with my background as a nurse and just with my own uniqueness as Monica Painter. And um, it's very important to me that I have, that I embody something before I start teaching it. And so Everything I do now, I really, really like to teach through my own personal experience and through teachings that resonate with me, right? Because there's a lot of teachings out there. There's a lot of ways that you can approach something and everyone's different. I know what, what has worked for me. I like to keep it really simple. I know what has worked for me. And typically, you know, the way the law of attraction works, the people that we call in, resonate with the way that you might be able to teach them to level up or shift in their life um, in whatever way. So that, yeah. So, I mean, it's really bizarre. Like the beginning of my online journey was a water machine. <laughs> and because I had to learn, like when you're, when you are selling or illuminating, that's what I'll say. When you're illuminating a product for someone, but you but you want to do it in a different way because I did not want to conform to any other, any um, old, you know, business paradigms. I didn't want to do business the old way. I didn't want to spam people and, and force people to look at my product. I don't want people running from me like, oh God, here comes the water girl, mm -hmm. right? So as I was learning to do my business in a different way, like I really call it a new earth business. It's, it's very different than anything else that is out there. Um, that it really doing the coaching and doing the healing, it all naturally aligned. 
because there are so many people out there that want to do it differently. It's one thing to come into the online space, but it's another thing to take an approach that truly leans into the law of attraction, to take an approach that you are, you know, really focused on the highest good of self and allowing that to overflow to the world around you. You know, like the way that I work is I don't look at someone and say, oh, there's a lead, right? This person might want to do the water business with me. I don't, that is not at all what I see. What I see in them is how can my journey empower them? In what way can my journey empower them? And that may be a messenger conversation. That might be an engagement and a post. That might be a $44 workshop. That might be a $2,000 one-on-one or, um, you know, small container that lasts three months. And it might be the water. Because I'm working with the holistic person and we can't ignore any facet of this journey. Mind, body, soul. The body's in there. And sometimes we forget that. I know in the beginning of my journey, I wanted to forget that. I just want to be out of my body. But it's a holistic journey. And so that's my approach. My approach is holistic. <laughs> I, I want someone to have a very well-rounded experience when they come into my field, but they get to choose. You know, which piece of this do you want to partake in? This, this, or this, or all of it? Yeah. I, makes I, sense? Yeah, I can see that. Uh, I've been offered also to do business you know, for doTERRA essential oils and forever creams, which somehow resonate with me because they should be organic and healthy and, you know, sustainable. I love that. And I couldn't get myself doing it. I mean, I was approached and my ex-wife said, hey, she took the doTERRA because I had forever on my name. Uh, and yeah. she was actually making the events at her work and other places, but she always asked me to do it. And somehow I could not get moving. And it's, it's funny. So probably it's something I should learn doing it. And even though I have a business engineering degree, uh, even a master's, somehow running business is alien yeah. to me. But uh, again, yeah. could be ancestral trauma, could be just self-doubt, mm -hmm. could be whatever, whatever, like many, many things. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I did essential oils for a while too, but, um, and I love essential oils. I use them, but we need water. <laughs> and we need healthy, activated, right? Structured water. We don't need essential oils. No, yeah. where, where does this water uh, you talk about, can you get it all around the world or is it just US, Japan? Uh, all around the world. Okay, because I was thinking about that as well. Like Switzerland, Denmark is healthy water from the tap. And then um, two years, three years ago, like, oh, we found, you know, poison and whatever chemicals in the groundwater. Yeah. And like, yeah, it's kind of logic <laughs> when I look what, what you've been yeah. doing. So, you know, it's all kind of like, and then, then you ask yourself, yep. oh, I probably should start buying bottled water, but then you don't really know where it comes from. You really don't know. Right. It's not regulated. And do you have the plastic leaching into the water? It sits for a couple of years before it hits the store shelf. And so, and that was my dilemma. I was like, okay, now we're drinking bottled water. And then I started getting those, you can get these big giant things of water, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. sit it Spencer, but it's still in plastic and it's still not regulated. So yeah, it's, it is a, it is a huge, huge issue that we are facing right now. And the, you know, the oceans. I saw a statistic that by the year 2050, if we don't shift, there's going to be more plastic water bottles in the ocean than there are fish in the sea. Yeah. That's staggering. But on the other hand, I also heard that uh, the, um, the plastic is gathering somehow in the big part of the, what is it, Pacific or whatever. Between yeah, well, there are five. There are five trash islands. Yeah, trash islands, Throughout. which then basically enable uh, plankton and other life to grow there. So it's actually in the middle of nowhere, in the desert of the ocean, uh, life is growing. So, you know, it's difficult to see. And I've also heard... Oh, well, I'm, that's interesting. I've not heard any positive take on the trash islands. Of course. I'm curious. W I'm going to have... Right. That's interesting. I mean, um, I'm also being attacked to not believe in the climate change. I'm like, yeah, the climate is changing, but I don't really believe that 100% goes on our back. Uh, yeah. We are we are changing globally the climate by cutting down 
rainforests and then there's no more rain uh, stuff right. like that right but i think the whole planet uh, there's volcanoes underwater we don't hear about until you see like two lines in a sentence that it was one of the hottest september but there was a volcano erupting which was one of the biggest ever and it created yeah. this heating of the surface i'm like yeah oh. <laughs> Yeah, so how can we spend that? Yeah, too many SUVs have been sold, and people don't want to buy electric cars. No, there was a big volcano. But the thing is, also, I was it this year or not too long ago? At least I heard also there are bacteria apparently which eat plastic now. I haven't really gone into into the depth, but oh. it was just a line or two lines somewhere. Yeah, you no, know, if yeah. it's really true, it will be. Mm -hmm suppressed because if that really happened right. then you know then it's not such a big let's utilize it right let's utilize it and uh, then people will see but i don't advocate that you throw away your plastic bottle or your plastic bag or whatever and i'm living in denmark which is probably the country per square kilometer square mile with the most coastline so okay i'm so shocked of seeing all that garbage laying around and then it's winding very strong and then whoosh it's in the ocean um, yeah. It's really sad. I would have it expected. Is sad. I would have expected to have more cleaning up, especially you know when I was unemployed for so long. I've never been asked to go in the park to clean up. I'd like, hey, you have to look for jobs. Have you looked for two or three jobs this week? And have you applied? Have you re uh, have you done this this? Instead of calling the people in and say, hey, for the last three four months you've been sitting home. I think uh, you have to come one day a week. You go and clean the, the beach. You clean the forest or something like that, right? So people get out and yes. they meet other people. Um, you create connections. It's not about punishment. Actually being like five people cleaning the, the beach, then you get out. Of course, yeah. you're in a wheelchair. No, but right, if you're healthy. Um, yeah. So now we talked about meditation, breath work, um, uh, wealth. Uh, what is guided meditation? Is there anything you want to share more about what you're doing? Uh, what you, how you can help people with besides buying water bottles or cleaner from you? Well, it's, it's actually not bottled water. It's a machine that sits on your counter and it connects to your tap and actually converts your tap water. So, um, that's amazing. Um, let's see. Hi. What I have going now is I'm not actually work. I'm not offering any um, workshops right now. I do have a three month container that is starting at the end of this month. That is a deep dive into soul connection, and we'll be doing all of the somatic practices to support the quantum shift. So the breath work, EFT tapping. We'll be learning about the physiology of those. I feel like it's important. My nurse brain wants you to understand a little bit about how the energy is converting into the physiology, right? Like how is this energetic process rounding into the physical and our physiology? And it's really fun to learn about that. So I'll be teaching about that in this container. We will be connecting with the ancestors. We're going to do a deep dive with ancestral support and shifting ancestral uh, beliefs and timelines. We'll be working with the elements. So all of the beautiful elements, of course, including water, and we won't leave fire out, um, the elements and the animal kingdom. And then we'll also be working with our galactic star family. So this container is really designed for whatever stage in your spiritual journey that you're at. It's designed to help you shift yourself, to shift your family's life, um, and then also to help you step into mission or if you're already doing your mission work, to help you step deeper into that mission work. And I'm very excited about this container. There, It will last three months. We're doing a one call a week that will last 90 minutes each call. And it's always channeled. So I, I get a basic framework and then my soul's like, okay, you're going to overthink it. So not going to give you any more, um, but it will, um, it will be absolutely magical. And I'm very, very excited to see the shift that not only they create in their lives, but I also create in my life because it's always a, 
a co-creation, a both and. I'm very much of the practice that there is no student or teacher. There is no hierarchy. We are here to learn from one another. I am simply illuminating what is available and you get to say yes and get to lean into what resonates with you. Uh, I just have the, I know how to structure it. And so um, that's, that's my most recent offering. And I always, if you check out any of my social media, um, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, those are the three spaces that I'm in most. There's always inspirational content that's free for you. I have my own podcast called Water Wisdom that you can access uh, on Facebook and YouTube. And I have tons and tons, countless amount of reels and lives that you can go tap into if a free offering aligns best. So for who is this uh, three months container? For someone which never ever heard about something like that and just hears it, says, hey, let's get it uh, go. or someone which has already a bit of experience or has to be advanced? Um, I really feel that anyone who actually is called to my message, anyone who's called into my frequency, that it would be appropriate for them. Okay, so, so don't be afraid that you just, the first time you hear a podcast or a message like that and you feel a little bit unsure, but something pulls you, um, yep. just, just reach out. Yeah, if you're that connected to feel the pull, then you're ready. Yeah. And we put uh, all the, the connections, all the links, everything about the water, about the website, about all the social media. We put everything in the show notes. So don't worry. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, I have so many other questions. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like I just started with the first question and uh, just went <laughs> deeper. Uh, <laughs> and um, it, it cannot leave my head. For some reason, ah, no, I know the reason. When I look at the at the screen here, uh, my second warm up question is: uh, What is what color would you be if you would be the fresh new color in a coloring box, and why would you be that color? Red. Red, and I look at the screen and I see all these turquoise colors there. Red, I would be red. Um... I say red because I am very, very called to the energy of Mary Magdalene. And she was a huge part of my deconstructing some of the deepest wounds around religion that I had. That I still, you know, it's I'm a work in progress, still working on those. And I, I'm bold, like the color red. I am pretty darn fearless and I really, really know that part of my mission is to be boldly outspoken for the highest and greatest good of all. And so it's, it's Mary Magdalene. It's, it's about that connection to the divine feminine and really illuminating that energy for the world because that is what the world needs right now and or and we need both right we need the masculine and the feminine empowered the empowered masculine the empowered feminine uh and and what is drawing that out is the feminine because it's been suppressed for so long and so when i look at you and what you're doing and having this deep conversation with you I'm celebrating you and witnessing you for being so bold to step up to do this work that still so many men are afraid to do. They're not quite ready. So you are pioneer and a way shower. And this engagement here, what we're doing, you know, and uh, we are balancing each other's energies just by engaging. Like this is so important that we have these high level, deep conversations between masculine and feminine energies, because we're just sharing, we're sharing codes. You know, if we could see the energetics of what is really going on here, we would just be heart exploding, mind blown. It's, I, I'm surprised that you called it red. For me, it's kind of like almost opposite to the background, to your shirt or dress or what you're wearing. And, you know, now you're drinking 
out of a bottle with the same kind of turquoise color. So yeah. So these are like this They're, bluish turquoise color is more like your favorite color then, or how comes that it's so? Uh, no, I wore red yesterday. I was in red yesterday. Um, I don't. I felt you know. It's part of me having the fullness of my experience. There are many facets to Monica, and it includes the fire and the water. Yeah, it's of both. The yin yang. It's um, sometimes I need a lot of water. Sometimes I need a lot of fire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep, I feel the same. Well, I'm glad I asked the question. It it was just like keep on bugging me to ask you the question it's it, it's one of the ones in the beginning and we, we we just went into love we we never really touched up on peace and acceptance i mean peace i could see also you you touched up on it during your conversation through the meditation mm -hmm. that you're more balanced out i think that's where it comes from but um is there anything else we forgot i mean we are already uh, <laughs> two hours of talk of course it's yeah. <laughs> interruptions in between but um did I forget something? Is there something like really like needs to come out? I don't think so. I feel, I feel complete in this. I feel like we had a very well-rounded conversation that will serve in some way. So Super. So then how can the people find you uh, if they just listen and want to note themselves uh, so you can speak it out? Yeah. So I spend a lot of time on Facebook as Monica Painter. You can just search Monica Painter. I have lots of lots of reels. I like to light a little bit of fire underneath you, get your attention with my reels. On TikTok, I'm very present and my TikTok is always manifesting magic. Those are really my two, those are my two main platforms. If you find me on those two platforms, you can find me anywhere. Like and your three months uh, container for the ones which listen to it in, in good time. Yes, that starts at the end of this month, the end of October. Um, 2023. Yeah. <laughs> we are, That's correct. And yes, where do you yes. find that? Is that also on Facebook or why do they reach out? Yes. To? Okay, super. Yep. You can look on Facebook for that information. Awesome. So thank you listeners for staying with us. Uh, thank you, Monica, for going so deep and be so vulnerable and uh, really go deeper than many people would dare to go. Uh, very vulnerable, hopefully helpful to, to many people which need to hear it. And uh, thank you. All right. Thank you so much.